Hello and welcome to tonight's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Deepa Sitharaman. I'm a tech reporter covering AI for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, before we get started, a couple of reminders. Tonight's program is being recorded, so please silence your phones for the duration of the program. Also, the Commonwealth Club would like to welcome any JCCSF guests who join tonight. If you have any questions for our speakers, please fill them out on the question cards that were on your seats, and if you are joining us online through the YouTube chat. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. Dr. Joy Blomuni is the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League and author of Unmasking AI, my mission to protect what is human in a world of machines. Dr. Blomini has been at the forefront of AI research with her lifelong passion for computer science, engineering, and art, influencing her groundbreaking work. And as the poet of code, Dr. Joy, as she likes to be called, creates art to illuminate the impact of AI in society and advises world leaders on AI harms and biases. We also have Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the AI research company behind ChatGPT and DALI, which maybe you've heard of. <laughs> OpenAI was founded in 2015 with the mission to build safe and beneficial artificial general intelligence. We'll get into what that means. Uh, uh, to benefit all of humanity, more than 100 million people use ChatGPT every week and more than two million software developers are using its AI models. Sam has flown all over the world this year discussing AI and safety with world leaders, and he's proposed at one point the formation of a global or US agency to license the most powerful AI systems and enforce safety standards. All context for the conversation we're about to get into. So let me start off just by asking you, Dr. Joy, in the book's intro, you write about the coded gaze. What is that? So I don't know if anyone here has heard of the male gaze, the white gaze, the post-colonial gaze. OK, so if we look at the notion of the male gaze, this came from media studies. And they were looking at film and the portrayal of women through a men's eye and what that rendered and what that left out. And so it was a discourse in terms of who's positioned as worthy and who has the power to decide uh, what's worthy. And so when I borrow that term and I'm thinking about tech with the idea of the coded gaze, it's looking at power again. Who has the power to shape the priorities, the preferences of tech? and also whose prejudices get embedded. And so that's the notion of the coded gaze, which I came across when I was literally coding in a white mask at MIT as a grad student working on a project around Halloween, which is why I had a mask that was supposed to track my face. And it wasn't getting my face that well. So at first, I actually drew a face on my hand. And when it detected the face on my hand, I was like, oh, wow. OK, now anything is up for grabs. So that's why I grabbed the mask. And when it detected the mask, I was just I was shocked because I was looking at something that's less than human being detected, whereas my dark skinned human face wasn't. And so for me, that was my first recognition of facing the coded gaze. Do you think, you know, we've had this broader conversation about existential risk in the AI field. I mean, what kind of attention do you think the industry and the field is paying attention to those kinds of harms, those ongoing harms that are happening to people today? It really depends on the groups you're speaking to. So when I talk to social justice groups or tech justice groups, uh, these are the issues they're thinking about people like Portia Woodruff, who was arrested eight months pregnant due to AI-powered facial misidentification. She reported having contractions while in the holding cell and had to be rushed to the emergency room after. And this was three years after uh, Robert Williams 
was also falsely arrested, facial recognition, misidentification in front of his two young daughters by the same Detroit Police Department huh. using faulty facial recognition. And so those in the communities I'm in, those are the types of conversations that I'm embedded in. Now, when it comes to the media conversation there, you certainly see a lot more focus on X risk. How about in the industry, Sam? I mean, the circles you run in, are they primarily talking about existential risk, long-term harms, ca potential catastrophes, or is it risks like what Dr. Joy's talking about? Most of the conversation is about the risks we face today and the impacts these systems are having today and in the near future. But there's definitely some of where is this going to go, and as these systems progress over the coming years and decades, and we get to a level of intelligence that we think we may get to that can surpass human intelligence in some ways, how do we make sure that humans are still at the center of the story and that we don't have a, so, some sort of catastrophic risk? So I'd say both are part of it, and I actually think that's healthy because it is this one continuous curve of the technology, and the, the, we have to make it work for people all the way along. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's certainly more of the short term. Are those ideas competing, the long-term risks versus the short term? Can you pay equal attention to both problems? Well, we pay, we and I think the field in general pay more attention to the short-term things. And I think that's as it should be because you can do more and understand more the things that are in front of you that you can actually observe. And the theoretical stuff is, is further out. But I, I think it is important to think about all of the risks and potential harms and benefits of AI yeah. along a continuum. And not like we try not to have people, at least at OpenAI, who are like, I only think about the long term. I only think about the short term. But, but say, like, we are trying to build and deploy continuously, iteratively AI into the world that's going to get more and more powerful. And we need to make that work all the way along the way. Dr. Joy, is that how you see it? No. So the way I see it is with AI doomerism, right? The sky is falling. Put a pause on it. It's, it's you know, it's, the, uh, it's a higher risk than climate change, et cetera. There is certainly a group of people, not everybody, uh, feeding into fear. And that fear does drive uh, dollars. So in the book, I talk about uh, AI safety, you know, getting hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, investment uh, with the framing of X risk uh, versus harms research may be getting millions, right? And so I do think the narrative shapes the flow of resources. And I do agree with Sam in terms of there being a continuum of risk. But where I see the most investment is where there's the most hysteria. Interesting. I actually think there's been almost very little productive investment that's gone into existential risk. In fact, if any of you know a productive way to invest, we'll do it. That'd be great. Um, it's, it's been a lot of like think pieces that I think have had somewhat limited impact so far. Um, that said, I, I think, although it's very important and it is our focus, I can't speak for other people in the field, but I think it's a lot of their focus too, who are deploying products, which are now pretty widely used to minimize the harms and maximize the benefits of these products. Um, the thing that I think is so hard to at least wrap my head around is we are building a technology that if it keeps going, if it continues on this curve, I think can either be the greatest or the worst thing humanity has yet built. And this is not our original observation. You know, I think the first time I ever heard this was from Stephen Hawking, but way before that I, I heard about it in a lot of different ways. And I think a lot of people can intuit this. And we have got to hold space for thinking about the future while we think about the present too. Like the, 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 it, I think it would be a mistake to only focus on, on one or the other. And to that point with X risk, I talk about lethal autonomous weapons. In fact, when I was first getting into uh, computer science and tech, I got into tech 
to avoid people, you know, and humans and the messiness of social situations. I wanted to build robots. That's how I ended up at the Media Lab. So I was, n I was working on an art project when the white mask thing happened in the first place. So for a while, I really didn't even want to engage. And as I was looking at some of the conversation at that time, there had been another type of letter. And this one was around lethal autonomous weapons. And my thought was, oh, wow, this, this isn't something I should get uh, involved in. Mm -hmm. But then as I saw um, integrations of think drones, guns, facial recognition, uh, technology, I had an opportunity to serve on the EU global tech panel. And so you had uh, EU defense ministers thinking through what the future of peace Another way of talking about the future of war, pick your you know, angle at uh, going uh, at it. And so there I was thinking through uh, what does it look like when we're applying AI to military applications? And so then got familiar with the campaign to stop uh, killer robots so we don't put the kill decision uh, in the hands of an automated uh, kind of system. But then I also start thinking about the ways in which AI can kill us slowly. So I was thinking about this notion of structural violence. And so we know the gun, the bullet, et cetera, in terms of acute, immediate violence. But what's the violence of uh, not having adequate health care, yeah. not having adequate uh, opportunity, mm -hmm. and how that also can lessen a life and the quality uh, of a life? So that's the other X risk I think about, the X risk of being X coded, exclusive exploited, condemned, or convicted? Hmm. I think we've had this conversation about how we are going towards artificial general intelligence. And Sam, you've talked about making progress uh, towards AGI, but it being conditioned on being both safe and beneficial. Could you talk a little bit about, I guess, what that means, how you determine what is safe, what is beneficial, and I guess, what is AGI? Easy questions. Um, <laughs> Make it safer. <laughs> I think AGI used to be something that we could kind of hand wave at, and we just sort of say, oh, it's going to be like when AI gets really smart. And people had all these like more precise definitions, but they were all sort of sloppy. And now as we start to get a little bit closer, I think the definitions really matter. And so there are some people who say, well, it'll be AGI when it can you know, do some jobs somewhat autonomously. And there are some people who say it won't be AGI until it can like solve all of physics. Um, and a lot of things in between and a lot of things closer or further. So I don't know what it means anymore because I think people use it in such different ways, but let's just say it means very smart AI, like GPT-10 kind of level thing if it stays on the current trajectory. I was thinking when you were saying that you got into tech because you wanted to avoid people that I both had sympathy for that. And it, I got into tech because I wanted to connect with people. I had a really hard time with it. Yeah. I, I, I was like a very extremely socially, I mean, I guess I still am, but as a kid, I was even more socially <laughs> awkward if you can believe it. Um, and finding the internet was a way that I was able to connect with people. And for me, that was, that was this example to me of, of how incredibly beneficial technology can be. I, I had gone from someone with like not a lot of friends and not super kind of connected and feeling very alone to, to something very different. And I'm always grateful for that. And it is a reminder to me of what we should aspire technology for technology to do. So when we talk about benefits, um, you were talking about healthcare earlier. I totally agree. Uh, I think we should find a way with AI to make sure everybody on earth gets great healthcare and great education. And more than that, we should just like cure diseases so that people need less healthcare. And I think this is possible. I think the two major trends of this decade will be that the abundance and capability of intelligence increases to a degree that we have not, we probably still can't quite wrap our heads around, even though we get a little, little preview with GPT-4 and we'll get more of a preview with GPT-5 and 6. But think how much less like humanity deserves much more than we we have now like we are all 
deserving of, of more and better and a higher quality of life and better healthcare, better education, better happiness, better entertainment, better connections with other people. And intelligence is fundamental to a lot of that. There are a lot of people right now, because the, the price of cognitive labor is, is quite high, there are a lot of people who just can't get all they'd like. And as we make that more available to people, we can do much more. I think the other big trend of this decade will be energy. As the price of energy falls and falls and falls and the abundance increases, um, ideas and the ability to make the things happen, that's a huge increase in quality of life. And doing that in a way where people are in control and get what they want. And of course, you know, we have to live in a society, so there's got to be some agreement on that. But that's, I think that's like some of the benefits we'll have. Safety is a great question. Sa you know, safe for who? And if I think something is safe and you don't, um, or if I want to be able to use a system in a certain way and you don't think I should get to use a system in that way, who gets to decide? A general principle that I think has always been right is the people that are going to be most impacted by technology deserve the most say in how it's going to get used and deployed and what the rules are going to be. Um, but this question of safety, we can agree on a lot of things like don't let someone make a bioweapon that they're going to use to create a global pandemic. That one's easy. Um, don't let someone sort of figure out how to like launch nuclear weapons. That one's easy. But there's a lot of other stuff where people can say, okay, we want safe AI and then have complete disagreement on every other specific case. So that's going to need to be um, a global and a complicated conversation. We do have a new tool and we don't know exactly how this is going to go yet, but the fact that AI can uh, learn an individual or a set of individuals value preferences means we can do something that we've never been able to do with any technology before in terms of giving people input over what the rules and what the value system are in a way that the technology can learn. But AI can make a lot of mistakes. And I'm not just talking about hallucinations or confabulations or whatever you want to call them. I mean, Dr. Joy started the whole this whole talk with the example of the coded gaze and the mask, right? That's also a mistake. So what, I mean, to what extent can you trust GPT-4 to police GPT-4 and to think about? Not very much. Yeah. Um, I don't think you should. I mean, we've certainly never said you should do that. Yeah. I think that'd be a mistake. But can AI adequately check or police other AIs? I mean, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Uh, I mean, I think humans should set the rules. Yeah. What do you think of all this? When I think of AI safety or even the term AI alignment, these terms have been evolving since I started the work. So I tend to ground the work of the Algorithmic Justice League with ideas of AI harm or AI discrimination. And then we've done quite a bit of work, you know, with the harms taxonomy and so that it's concrete. Yeah. And so I think it is worthwhile thinking about the potential of AI, the ability to maybe cure this or maybe do that. And I think we should put energy towards it, absolutely. I think the breakthrough with AlphaFold and what that can do for medicine uh, is huge. But I get worried if we're not able to specify not just what potential risk could be, but what the landscape of harms look like and what the emerging harms look like across an entire AI uh, life uh, cycle. And so what I tend to see is conversations, if you look at the life cycle from design, development, deployment, many people are looking at what happens when you're deploying the system, right? So to your point, don't create the bio weapon. We're looking at wh whose ideas animate what's made in the first place in design yeah. and what kind of prejudices might be uh, embedded, right? Even the type of AI system you create in the first place, safe from who? Surveillance is often saying safe from the other. I tend to be among the other, <laughs> you know? So when I hear the safety frame, I question it with safety and surveillance and who is being um, actually looked at. And 
under what terms. When I think about development, this is so much of what I grappled with with my research because I was very complicit in the processes I critique. I was scraping data online to build my data sets to then test other uh, facial analysis systems. And so this notion of data provenance and also the data sources, do we have a sense of what we're actually putting into these systems? Are we in a mystery meat sort of situation, which can be the case? Then we finally get to deployment. We're like, we hope it works. Send us some feedback. Yeah. And and in that whole conversation, I put that under people thinking through uh, preventing AI harms. What I almost never hear discussed is the idea of redress. So what happens if something goes wrong? I mean, we tried our best, but somehow someone got harmed, right? What, what happens to that person, not just in the future, but also people who have already been harmed, yeah. right? Artists, creatives who are talking about the ways in which their data has been used to power very powerful AI systems and saying, what about us? So I think about that entire life cycle. Um, Sam just mentioned that the people who are most affected by AI systems should have the most say in how they're being built, how they're being deployed. But that isn't happening right now, and hasn't been happening, right? Confirmed. I think there are always ways to make more of it happen, and we need to do that. I think there are a lot of important ways in which it is happening. Um, and I think that, I think it's always great to hold companies accountable for not doing more. So I don't want to push back on that and like strong plus one to everything you said. But I think as we learn what people want from these systems, the users, artists, data providers, I think it is our responsibility and we have been to listen more and more and continually make changes. So we made Dolly one. There were a lot of things people were excited about. They said, oh, it's not going to do this, not going to do that. That's fine. Dolly two, they're like, hmm, it did things that we didn't think it was going to do. Now we have different feelings. Now we want you to change how you do it. We want these new features. We want to be able to opt in or opt out. Or we want this data not in, or we want a new economic model. We say, great, we'll get that in for the next version. We put out Dolly 3. We address a lot of the problems with Dolly 2. Now we say, okay, you know, you have all these things. Now I want a new thing. And that, that contact with reality and society and continuing to listen to people to figure out how to adapt it, to figure out new models for everybody involved in the ecosystem that makes all this work. Um, that's, I think, the only way to get to the right answer. It's got to be a dialogue, and it doesn't, you can't talk about it in an ivory tower. You've got to put things in people's hands, figure out where there are benefits, where they want things to do differently. It doesn't mean you just like build something and ship it. When we finished training GPT-4, it took us eight months of safety testing, of conversations with people who were going to use it in different ways or whose data people wanted not in or in uh, or where there was like bias in the system that we had to do new research for. Um, you know, even some of our big, biggest critics, we, we appreciate this with from the move from GPT-3 to GPT-4 would say like, man, openly, I really listened on these biases in the system and how they addressed it and these situations where we told them it was breaking or not working for one group or another. So I think that's, the way that we all figure out how to build systems. It's like not just the technology, but the whole system, technology, society, people, everything, economic flows that sort of work for all of us. So I have a question in terms of a Dolly 3, right? Because one of the options, as I understand it, and of course you're closer to it than I am, so let me know if I'm off, is that now artists have the option to opt out. Is that the case? Well, you, could, you an artist can like put a block and say never generate. I actually don't think we'll generate in any living artist style, but I'm not totally sure. That's what I believe is the case, though. Got it. So how do you respond to artists and creatives who are saying, given that some of the training data came from their work, they feel they are owed something or that it should be deleted? Well, again, we're trying not to go, tra like the reason it won't, there, there is a block because in some cases there's, um, 
you know, something that like gets through the training set, uh, or like information was improperly tagged or whatever, but we're not off there like trying to train on artist work. Like uh, there's other systems that do do that. But if you use ours, there's like a reason it won't generate in the style of an artist. The reason I ask is as a new author and also someone uh, who recorded the audiobook, I'm now a member of the Authors Guild and the National Association for Voice Actors. So I went to this FTC uh, convening and they were talking about the impact of generative AI on uh, the creative economy. And different representatives were talking about the four C's of consent. Uh, compensation, control, and credit, right? When it comes to not just open AI, the entire AI ecosystem. And I was curious how that might be operationalized. So you mentioned voice. I think that that's like a, a great example. Um, we built a system some time ago uh, that can generate audio. It has all these great benefits. Um, and it, it helps with accessibility. Uh, it does a lot of other things too. One of the things it could do was take a 15 second, 30 second sample of anyone's voice and make a super convincing um, AI voice that sounds just like you. Now, there's obviously huge challenges with that. So we thought about it and decided not to release it uh, because we knew that putting that into the world would have a bunch of misuse. So we just said, you know what, we're not going to do that. Not every technology you build is something you should release. And as you said, you've got new experience with this. And like voice is a very personal thing. Um, other people have since released things at different levels of quality there. But uh, I, and I think the world is going to have to get, I mean, they're going to be open source tools that are great at voice cloning, I think, pretty soon. Uh, but that still doesn't mean we're going to do it, of course. And I think what's going to happen more and more is companies like us and others will just build some things and say, we shouldn't release this. Shouldn't release this at all. Shouldn't release this until we can figure out safeguards for it. Um, but that's kind of how I think it goes. Can you talk at all about how you see AI evolving over the next 12 months? We're 12 months away from a presidential race in this country that, um, you know, the last several elections have been contentious, right? I mean, there've been a lot of fake news. Yeah. There's been a lot of uh, kind of arguing back and forth. Polarization has only accelerated. Do you think AI plays a role in amplifying those problems or and or fixing those problems? Like what can be, what's AI's role next year? Well, even this conversation about voice clones in the introduction, I talk about a woman who hears her daughter's voice, help mom, help mom, these bad men have me. And it's a voice clone. And even if it's not the best voice clone, algorithms of exploitation are exploiting more than just the voice, right? They're also exploiting uh, your emotions um, as well. And I'm also thinking with uh, disinformation and elections coming up, uh, this notion of algorithms of distortion. Yeah. And I'm thinking of an evaluation that Bloomberg News did of uh, stable diffusion. So uh, text to image generator. And uh, what they decided to do was give prompts for high paying jobs, uh, CEO, right? You know, uh, architect, uh, low paying jobs, uh, fast food worker, um, and so forth. And so probably not surprisingly, the higher paid jobs were lighter skinned men, white men, and the lower paid jobs were, there was suddenly some diversity in the training set, people of color, and then also stereotypes. Um, so whether it was criminal stereotypes like terrorist, uh, inmate, drug dealer, right? You saw the faces of men of color being generated. Right. So here you might say, okay, here is a mirror, AI reflecting society. But this is where what I'm seeing is more of a kaleidoscope of distortion. So for example, with architects, I believe in the US women make up about 34% of architects. This particular model represented women as architects 
around 3%, less than 3% hmm. of the time. So what I'm also thinking about the next set of generative image making, or it could be audio, it can be multimodal, right? What does it look like when the technologies that are meant to take us into the future are regressing on, it. we weren't on parity, right? But even those slow uh, gains made. And so that is something I continue to uh, be worried about with these algorithms of distortion. What's the line between representing, having these systems represent what is true today versus aspiration? Women are, I don't know what percentage of American CEOs are women. It's not a lot. Do you want the response for CEO to look the way it really is, or do you want it to look a little bit more diverse and to reflect an aspiration? I definitely know I don't want to see the regression, which is yeah. that kaleidoscope of distortion. So I do, but I also think we should be doing better than the status quo. And that's the struggle with general, general purpose systems. I tend to look at how do you have uh, uh, more diversity, smaller bespoke uh, system. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Is this a historic analysis, right? Um, even in that historic analysis, our own understanding of the contributions of many people, if you think of hidden figures in the faith, space race and all of that, isn't even accurate in the first place. But I do think we should uh, aspire for better and certainly push back on worse. Sam, what do you think of that? I mean general purpose models, can they address these issues? Or is it really just, this is why you need smaller, more specific models? Because I mean, GPT-4 is general purpose, right? Yeah, I, I think people, there's so much benefit from general purpose models that we need to find a way to make them usable and, and useful. And I would say, um, I, I would go further than say, I don't want a regression. I would just say like, let's have this be aspirational. Now there, there's definitely some complexity there. Yeah. Um, we made the decision to make some of our products aspirational and then we would get into things like where, uh, you know, one example I remember is with, with kindergarten teachers when we were um, displaying those as more gender balanced women who are disproportionately kindergarten teachers would say this is like if you gender balance us out of the picture here and make it look more like 50-50, yeah. that, that's erasing us. And so it, it's not as easy as it sounds in every case, but I think aspirationally, we should be aspirationally better. Um, and I think technology can be a force for that. I, I also think that, you know, you can, you can read a bunch of different research papers out there, but there are like a lot of, there's like a lot of research that say the GPT-4 model that is out there is like less bias on an implicit bias test for whatever than almost any other human, which is no huge surprise. But this technology, I think, can help. We don't always, we don't like, we do need to be vigilant about this technology making problems of bias worse, but I think we can see lots of reasons why it can make things better too. Can I just briefly touch on the election topic though? Because I think this yes. is super important. Um, I am definitely worried about the impact that AI is going to have on the election, but the main worry I have, I think, is not the one that gets the most airtime. What everybody talks about is deep fakes. And deep fakes, I think, will be a problem politically in society in a lot of other ways. But in some sense, that's fighting the last war. We, we know about deep fakes. Uh, people have some degree of antibodies to them. We have some societal vigilance. People know if they see an image or a video or, or whatever, it might not be real. And you know, everybody thinks that they're not susceptible to it. It's just somebody else that is. We're all probably somewhat susceptible, but it's at least a known issue. The thing I'm really worried about, about this upcoming election and future ones and more broadly, is the sort of customized one-on-one -on -one persuasion ability hmm. of these new models. And that's a, that's a new thing that we don't have antibodies for. And I I think we'll all be more susceptible to it than we realize. What does that look like? Like ChatGPT trying to convince you who to vote for? Or like what well, would probably it look like? not chat. I mean, if you're asking like ChatGPT, who should I vote for in the election? I have some other questions for you. Um, <laughs> but, but it means like systems on the internet powered by AI to varying degrees that are just like subtly influencing you. So how... 
is OpenAI trying to address that problem? Address that problem because you guys are uniquely positioned to kind of address this concern that you have, right? So what well, are you doing? I mean, we, we on our own system, we're doing a lot to address it, but there will be other models that people are using that are just out in the world that I don't think we we or really any other single model can detect. There's this, there's like a question a single company can detect. There's this question of like, can you use an AI system to detect the outputs of other AI systems? Can you watermark it? Can you do something even for systems that can't aren't watermarked? Can you like detect the right patterns? And I frankly think those capabilities are somewhat overstated. There's there's the social media platforms can maybe do something because they can see across the whole thing, but and, and see how sort of information is flowing through the network. But to look at any short piece of text and say this was AI generated, this wasn't. I think that's going to be harder. So are you working with the other AI companies to think about some of these problems? Are you working with the social media companies? What's the plan? I, I think the companies are all going to do, the AI companies are all like very focused on this and the companies are mostly going to do the right thing. But it is like a foreign adversary that has trained their own AI system that none of us even know about. Hmm. That's the kind of thing I'm, I'm worried about. I would say I'm extremely worried about synthetic media and deep fakes uh, with upcoming elections, even if it is understood or known by some within uh, the tax space. Uh, I'm, even what we're seeing with the current uh, conflict, right, that's going on right now with what is happening in Gaza and the proliferation of misinformation there, I don't, I think we're already getting a preview of what it looks like when generative AI tools are made more readily available, whether it's through a company or even now more perniciously with open source models. So I do commend some of the efforts around content credentialing, which is to say we're not trying to say this is right or this is wrong, AI versus AI. Instead, this is approach of verifying this has come from a trusted media source. I don't think that gets at everything, but I certainly do think it's an important starting place. And I think this is going to be an even deeper uh, problem as we go into next year. I just have one more question. For, I actually have a lot of questions, but I will just ask one more question, and then we're going to get to the uh, audience questions. Oh, yeah. um, why is any of this inevitable? You know, we've been talking about this for a year. It's the AI revolution. AI is going to be in everything, all your products, in your grocery store, in your fridge. Uh, why, why do we need it? So to me, I don't subscribe to technological determinism because I always think of human uh, agency, right? And so I don't think AI is inevitable in the way that any technology is inevitable, but I do think there is momentum, yeah. right? And there is inertia. And what I fear is the stories we talk about and tell ourselves with AI and its capabilities. For example, I think of this nonprofit, uh, NEDA, National Eating Disorder um, Association. And so I think it was May 20th, yeah, May 25th, I see a headline. Uh, their workers had unionized, management said no. So they fired the workers who were doing uh, the chat kind of call in for help, and they replaced it with a chat bot. The chatbot was then uh, giving advice that's known to make eating disorders worse. Hmm. And so then the next headline, I don't think it was even a week, it was like maybe May 27th, right? May 25th, chatbot online. May 27th, chatbot offline, right? <laughs> but what I'm getting at here is it wasn't the AI's capability, it was the stories we were telling ourselves 
about the AI's capabilities. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me think of this notion I've been thinking of, the apprentice gap. So what happens when we're using AI for entry-level jobs or entry-level processes? How do you then gain mastery? How do you build your professional calluses? I was in Rolling Stone uh, a little while ago. I and <laughs> so I was inspired to go get a guitar, right? So I got my guitar. I was really excited. My Les Paul Appetite Verse Slash. Anyways, for those who know, you know. And as I was playing it, I realized, oh, my calluses from other hats when I wasn't always an AI researcher, right? Those calluses were still there. And that's when I start thinking about professional uh, calluses, because if we don't replenish the seed, are we then living in the age of the last experts uh, or the last uh, masters? And so that's where it's not even just as AI going to expand or evolve that, yes, because we are expanding and we are evolving as um, just people. But it's the narratives we tell ourselves and who shapes those narratives, because those beliefs then feel the type of AI systems we create. Sam, why is AI inevitable? It's, it's not. It's not. Um, it, it is if people find it useful and if people like the new vision of society, the narrative and the actual results that we deliver more than the alternative. But I, I am not a believer in technological determinism either. Um, and I certainly think that if people decide they don't want something or it's not helping or it's not a better tool or it's not giving them a better life or society is not better off, then um, you know, sometimes we kind of get trapped into a, a local maxima that can happen for sure. And then we have to correct. And I'd point to some of the ills of social media as an example of that, where we kind of got sucked into this dopamine loop or some of us did without, without really wanting it or without realizing it. But I think fundamentally humans are tool builders with better tools. We do better and better things, but there is a long graveyard of things that we thought were going to be technological revolutions and better tools that either weren't or people didn't want or people did for a while and they stopped. Um, if AI can help people have better lives, it'll happen because um, we all kind of want that. And like, I do believe in the magic of our society to get successively there over time. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, I won't say all of AI won't happen, but certain parts of AI won't happen. And we'll just, people will decide they don't want that or society will decide we collectively don't want that. And I think people are very good over time at figuring out what, what tools are helpful, what tools don't. And, and again, there's like, <laughs> I was laughing when you said in my head that in my head, when you said that, cause I, re I remember sitting in a setup very, very much like this. And someone said, is uh, cryptocurrency inevitable? <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I've been in other conversations about previous technologies where there were like some people were like, this is going to happen. This is the only thing that matters in the future. And then people said or our leaders said or whatever, this, you know, this doesn't work for this reason, that reason. Um, but the future happens because people work hard to invent it and we learn and iterate along the way and nothing has to happen or is, you know, has like a divine right to happen. I think one piece I think about is who gets to decide what happens and who has the power to shape what is adopted, right? And so sitting in a privileged position, it can be easier to say, we don't want that. And then when we think about the X-coded, right, certainly those who are being harmed uh, by AI systems. If you're denied housing because of a tenant screening algorithm, if you're fired or you don't get promoted because your company adopted an AI system, oftentimes you don't even know the coded gaze is at work. The example with coding in a white mask, part of why it was effective was because it was totally. visible in that way. But there are so many ways in which those who have power 
can adopt AI tools uh, behind closed doors unless if we have measures, right, and laws and legislation uh, that require, one, the tools are fit for purpose in the first place. And we're not just experimenting and using people as guinea pigs when we're talking about life opportunities. And that took me a while to come to, again, the kid who wanted to build robots and maybe deal with people sometimes, right? But not all the time. And then uh, understanding the responsibility I had as somebody within the tech space and then later as an academic because so many people don't have access to make decisions about these tools. So I think it's important. I mean, we have, I think, a lot of laws about when people can and can't use AI for these reasons. I think those are super important. And I think as time goes on, we'll find that you know, housing decisions is an example. You Wait, could... just sorry. Are we saying we have a lot of laws? We do, yeah. On AI? About where you can and can't use AI. I mean, I was, yeah, like the conversation I was in right before was about new things where you couldn't, couldn't use AI in medicine. So it... I think this is this is a good thing. Well, I would push back because part of what we've been pushing for for the Algorithmic Justice League is that we have laws in place. So we did a lot of pushing to get, for example, within Brooklyn and Cambridge and half a dozen other American cities, we have laws on the book that say you can't use facial recognition in law enforcement for specific things. We've had proposed legislation for things like the Algorithmic Accountability Act, right? But that isn't yet in no place. No disagreement that we yeah. don't don't have all the ones that we should. Yeah. Uh, I, I just meant that I think the fact that we have some and that we will have more. Are you saying laws like anti-discrimination law that could then be applied to AI more no, broadly? No, I specifically meant things like saying you can't use AI systems that don't pass a certain like explainability threshold for lending, lending loan underwriting or something like that. Hmm. I think right now what I'm concerned with is we have executive orders, which I think are good. We have the uh, NIST uh, risk management framework. We have the AI Bill of Rights. But we don't yet, from my understanding, we're in that conversation, have the mechanisms actually in place that would compel companies or would compel government agencies to take specific actions. Office of Management um, and Budget, they just released some guidelines, I think, last week. So we're, we're there, I, but it's yeah, not I, mean, I think law. the point we can probably agree on is we don't have enough, or there's still big pieces we're missing. Mm. Um, the, the point, you know, we, we put out ChatGPT as this like thing that we thought was going to be a little research preview. Mm. We did not expect it to be really a product at all, much less a very successful one. But people started using it for like really valuable things. And we hear these like stories every day of how people who had didn't have access before, didn't even maybe think about something like this before, are now able to use AI in their lives in these super positive ways. And then on the other hand, there's a bunch of ways that people are going to use AI in all these negative ways. And the trick, and I'm sorry, because I, I can see you trying to stop us. And You're making my life easier. <laughs> That's um, fine. Just keep going. I have questions. <laughs> I had a poem to read. No. <laughs> okay. um, there are a lot of questions, though. Yeah. So just okay, I'll just wrap know. it up and saying I, th I think yeah. the trick in, in front of all of us, the technology developers, society, people, is going to be now that we have this amazing new thing in the world, how do we get more of the good and less of the bad? And I think that is the story of, of technology and society. So there are a lot of questions about the safety, the safety question. And so, I mean, they're all excellent. Um, I'm, this one is just very simple. Responsible and explainable AI. What is it? What does it look like? What's your take? Because people use these words a lot. They talk about yeah, responsible and explainable AI, but what does it mean? To me, this framing of alignment and then this framing of beneficial AI and then this framing of responsible AI has to be grounded somewhere. I like the grounding of the AI Bill of Rights released by the uh, White House last year, right? Which is talking about safe and effective systems, systems where you have protections from discrimination, systems where there is privacy and consent. And I think also importantly, but doesn't get talked about as often, 
alternatives and fallbacks. So I think, for example, when Algorithmic Justice League, we were talking about the IRS's adoption of IDMe, a facial recognition vendor that then became part of the gateway for some people to access uh, benefits, right? It could be veterans. Um, and then also with the IRS's use, access to basic tax information. And there was algorithmic uh, bias uh, involved uh, there as well. So I do think it's really important to be really concrete, right, about what alternatives look like. So for example, with the pushback on using biometrics to access government services, now there's an exploration of what does it look like to use post offices and to give people jobs, and part of their job is actually verifying people's identities uh, as humans, you know? And so this is an example of an alternative. But we don't hear that as much, what those alternatives would be. Instead, we get more of that AI will happen, and so now we have to adjust, and that takes away our agency of choice and saying where we can use it, where we can have an option. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. Since those who are most impacted or harmed by AI are not the ones designing the systems, how can we ensure these voices are represented without relying on disadvantaged groups to make these systems accessible? And I guess I would also add without disadvantaged groups being the ones to right. raise the alarm, especially if they have no interest in contributing. Yeah, do you want to go? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think for that, the responsibility will be on companies like us to make sure that we are doing everything we can to get truly global input uh, from different countries, different communities, the entire socioeconomic stratum, and, and to proactively collect and do it in a fair and just and equitable way what people want. From. So one thing that people have talked about, which I think doesn't quite work but is an interesting framework is can ChatGPT chat with all of its users around the world, figure out what they all want out of you know what it should do, what it shouldn't do, what the defaults are, what the broad bounds are, where are the cases it's not allowed to be used and where can you use it in other systems too. And then can ChatGPT figure out how to like adjust that for the fact that different groups have wildly different levels of interest and access to this technology and align to that thing. Now, again, I think a bunch of reasons, tyranny of the majority and others, that that doesn't quite work. But I think, it's, I think it is on us and companies like us to figure out systems that can help with this problem. I think companies have a role to play, but this is where I see governments needing to step in because their interest should be uh, the public uh, interest. So I do think there should be uh, penalties, right? And disincentives for if your system uh, is harmful, because I do think there would be a more cautious uh, approach if it costs you something, for example, to translate um, somebody who is posting about their faith and then label them as a terrorist, hmm. which has happened, right? And in that case, it's a, oh, my bad. It, we didn't mean to, which is true. I don't think they did this uh, intentionally. But if there were uh, penalties, right, for making those sorts of breaches, how might that change uh, the culture of design and deployment? Yeah, because even the executive order that you guys just mentioned, I mean, it's not binding, right? I mean, you don't, well, actually, it's binding, but it, you should, but it, what's the legal ramification for falling short? Do you get sued? Do you, well, yeah, breaking you're looking the law, at me. Yeah, you can. Yes, but an executive order, right? I mean, I don't know. You tell me, Dr. Joy. You look like you have something to say. Am I wrong? I might be wrong. So I think where the government has teeth on the executive order, and I commend the executive order because it is a comprehensive full press approach, is where federal funding is linked, right? So to the extent that they are requiring agencies when they're adopting systems, right, to undergo particular checks, they hold the purse strings, so there's something to be done. 
What we've seen with the companies are volunteer commitments. You have the G7 agreeing to volunteer commitments, et cetera. And as much as I'd love to rely on the goodwill of companies, you know, I still want the assurance of legal protection. We, yeah, of course. Um, we, we have been calling for government regulation here, I think the first and, and, and the loudest of any company. We absolutely need the government to play a role here. It does not excuse the companies from not doing what we can too. I think voluntary commitments are a good way to start. Uh, the legislative process is slow. The executive order process we see can be a little faster, but you should want all of those things. You should want the companies to make voluntary commitments, but you shouldn't trust us on those. Like you should, you should want the government to sort of set the rules here. And I think the government didn't do enough of that in the last tech cycle, uh, I think has learned a lesson, we'll do more now, but that's what's gotta happen. Like that's, no one should just trust the companies here. I think this is really important. Interesting. We have a lot of questions about the economy, but before we get there, I want to read this one. I fear manipulation by AI, ease my concerns. <laughs> Do you have anything to ease people's concerns here? <laughs> because um, you said even beyond, right, synthetic media. I fear it too, a lot. I, I think this is a place where, speaking of things where we need the government to set some guidelines and we also need to hold the companies accountable and also the non-companies that just are gonna deploy things here. Like, I am, I think I'd be lying to you to ease your concerns here. I'm, I'm quite nervous about this myself. Great. <laughs> <laughs> to, to offer some hope though, and part of why I wrote Unmasking uh, AI was between fear and fascination was to actually think through uh, how we use our collective voices and also our individual stories to push back. And so in that case, I think one of the things to do is to share your story of manipulation or exploitation. That's why I share that story of uh, Jennifer hearing her daughter so that other people know that could happen to you too, so that you are more uh, vigilant. So I do think the storytelling is a start. And then as we saw with the Brooklyn tenants who said, you know what, facial recognition to get into my apartment, no thanks. And then they kept uh, pushing back. I think all of these are examples that recognizing the problem, which I don't even always take for granted. I remember when I started this work and I would say algorithmic bias and people were like, what, what is even AI? <laughs> Before we get to um, algorithmic bias. So that we're at a point with an executive order, that we're at a point with a, a AI safety summit happening in the UK and this is a priority agenda item it is immense progress. And I do think it's up to people like us, people like you in the room to say, what your concerns are, right? So if manipulation is what those concerns are, then we start thinking through what we can actually uh, do about it. So I'm very much like, let's name the concern so we can get to work. Actually, I thought of something positive to say. Um, <laughs> I, I think people are really smart and really resilient. And we have had a long history of facing challenging technologies before that bring new challenges to the world that we hadn't seen before. And we may stumble a little bit, but we find a way to address the challenges and, and still get the benefits. And even though right now it looks a little daunting, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll figure it out. Is there an example? You know, do you think, of, is there a historical example that you reach for? Technology? Yeah. Just where we, it was daunting and then we adapted. I mean, I think right? like, I. There's so many by like I, I, reading the stories of what very smart people said after atomic weapons were developed about the chances of our survival being 0%, 2%, you know, mm -hmm. just that they didn't see any way through it. Yeah. We got through that recombinant DNA. I think, again, we got through that. Social media, I thought, was kind of going to destroy the fabric of society. And we're still here. I mean, weakened for sure, but still here. Um, hmm. I, I think like we, we do 
not always in the moment, but over time we show incredible, I think, wisdom and resilience and adaptability, and we can face huge new challenges and get through them. I got one last audience question. Um, I'm gonna try to uh, combine a few of them because all of these are about the economy. What, you know, and how does AI, you know, how soon will human, humans be replaced by autonomous, independent, pure technology without human presence? But this is another uh, interesting question too. As a student, I fear using models like ChatGPT I fear that using models like ChatGPT will make me dumber or lazier. Do you think future generations will be able to find the balance with using AI? So how does it transform our economy and does it make us stupider? <laughs> that's, that's getting a little bit at that apprentice gap mm -hmm. uh, piece that I was uh, speaking to. I think the AI systems that are being developed are forcing discipline. So when you have what appears to be the easy way out, what structures do you actually put in place, right, to do what might be difficult, like exercising consistently? So now we have a way where we don't have to exercise our brains consistently if we're outsourcing some of what we would have to do in a regular uh, day. So I think just like you have to set up routines to keep your body sharp, you're gonna have to set up routines to keep your mind sharp. Hmm. Sam? I, I have great faith in humanity on this topic in particular. I, I, the kids that were a few years older than me in school, um, they would tell these stories of how when Google first came out, I think it was like, very, very early 2000s, teachers would make them promise to sign things saying they wouldn't use Google for their homework. <laughs> um, because if you could just find all the information, like you never had to memorize anything, you didn't have to learn. And I remember at the time that sounded to me like stories I had read about of teachers banning calculators because they say, well, why have math class if there's a calculator? So we've got to kill these things. And I think kids born today that grow up using these tools will be far smarter and more capable than any of us. And I think that's awesome. Like that's the way it's supposed to go. You give people better tools, they do more, they use more of their cognitive capacity on new and exciting areas. Um, and that is how we make human progress. Like think about what we are all capable of because of the tools that the people who came before us built for us, contributed it back to this sort of like long unwinding story of human progress. And now we get to build on top of that and make a new one. And people that have that are gonna build on top of this and make even far better ones. And you talk to students who use ChatGPT and some of them will say, okay, yeah, uh, it can write my paper for me, that's great. But a lot of them will also say, but now I can learn these new things in these new ways, or I can do new things in these ways. And the world that they're all gonna go out into and become a member of society and is gonna have these tools. And so learning how to use them and learning what you can do with them is, is great. Um, it's true that the pos like capability goes up, you know, people can do more, but that means expectations go up too. And people are not only able to do more, but our expectations go up and we want them to do more. And, and, and you know, we're going through a little bit of a lurch right now, but we'll evolve and we'll expect more of each other and we'll be delighted that we can express our creative abilities and our ideas better. Um, that's all wonderful. The time of when, you know, we just automate things and humans don't do anything, I think that is never. Um, I think that, again, it's, it's so tempting to think of AI as a creature and not a tool, but it's really important to remember that it's a tool and not a creature. This is a thing that we use to do whatever we want uh, and to do more. And that humans are really good at knowing what other humans want. And so we'll be able to create for each other, for all of us, for ourselves, better and better things. Um, I, another AI memory from when I was a little kid, I, when AI first beat humans at chess, uh, the IBM Deep Blue thing, the prevailing wisdom was, that's it, chess is over. 
if AI can win, no human ever wants to play chess again. It's done. And, you know, fast forward many decades, chess has never been more popular. Not only to play, but to watch. And I don't know about you all, but I don't know anybody who watches like two AIs play each other, <laughs> right? Like we really are wired to care about humans and what other humans do. And in fact, if you use AI to cheat, that's like really bad. So the jobs will change for sure. Uh, we'll be able to do new things. We'll find new ways to be useful to each other, to make each other happy, to make life better and better. But it's just a new tool. We'll, we'll just go on to greater heights. I, now that you're taking more of a positive tone, I'll, I'll counter a little bit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can keep going. So I wonder about who gets to enjoy these new tools. Um, and I think about the people who make the tools possible that aren't always visible, right? So the content moderators, the data uh, scrapers, uh, we actually have a different type of role at the Algorithmic Justice League of an AI uh, harms uh, analyst. And so I think about this notion of the digital divide that's been around for a while, who has access to computing. You still have billions of people who are not on the internet. Um, and then I also think about AI in terms of a digital chasm. And so even what I thought what you were saying was interesting because I was at MoMA and I was looking at Unsupervised, the beautiful data uh, AI uh, moving mural. And there were babies crawling. So the poetic part of me is like, AI hey, natives start to crawl and then the whole thing is uh, shifting as well. And so looking at the kid whose parents have brought them to MoMA and this is their environment, right? What that trajectory is, you know, versus somebody else who maybe their school decided we're afraid of AI, so we're not going to let uh, students experiment. Meanwhile, the private school is saying, let's bring in the tools so people um, are equipped. So I'm um, looking at those trajectories and thinking through what that chasm looks like, could be, and then how do we close it? Dr. Joy, you're a poet, and I just want to give you the final word here. I understand you have a, something you'd like to read. Uh, yes, I have a poem. This uh, I wrote earlier this year, um, and then someone asked me if a chatbot wrote the poem. <laughs> and I felt some kind of way. I did. So now I sign my poems as poet of code, uh, certified human made. But maybe I, I did that too. So the poem I'd like to close us out with is called Unstable Desire. Unstable Desire. Prompted to competition, where be the guardrails now? Threat in sight will might make right. Hallucinations taken as prophecy. Destabilized on a middling journey to outpace, to open chase, to claim supremacy, to reign indefinitely. Haste and paste, control altering deletion, unstable desire remains undefeated. The fate of AI still uncompleted. Responding with fear, responsible AI beware. Prophets do snare, people still dare to believe our humanity is more than neural nets and transformations of collected muses. More than data and errata, more than transactional diffusions. Are we not transcendent beings bound in transient forms? Can this power be guided with care, augmenting delight alongside economic destitution. Temporary band-aids cannot hold the wind when the task ahead is to transform the atmosphere of innovation. The android dreams entice, the nightmare schemes of vice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. We encourage you to pick up a copy of Dr. Joy's book here or at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to support the club's effort in making this programming possible, please visit their website. I'm Deepa Sitharaman. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.